Okay, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to another uh, meeting of our Parents Advisory Council. This is our COVID-19 update for the school year. It's a follow-up to the letter that was sent home uh, earlier in the week. So um, without any further ado, um, let us bring up uh, the slideshow. Okay, well, again, it's great to see everybody this evening and welcome to our audience out on the live stream on the PAC. Okay, and remember that uh, it's uh, 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 our PAC is a group of uh, parent volunteers and students who provide input and feedback um, on uh, various topics that we bring up throughout the school year. So uh, without any further ado, let's go right to the agenda for this evening. And this evening, we are going to be focusing on contact tracing, quarantine protocols, uh, support for students in quarantine and testing. And I think these are all issues that are of great interest to our parents. So we'll try to add uh, clarity uh, to these issues this evening. But first, let's start off with a bit of good news here. And this really is uh, some spectacular news. And so I'd um, like to extend congratulations to uh, senior Avi Bakshi and uh, Ian uh, Bargir for uh, winning second place um, in category grand prize at the Regeneron International Science and Engineering Fair, Fair. And this is the amazing part of all of this that um, they will be presenting their work, um, which uses edge computing and artificial intelligence to model the spread of mosquitoes at a conference in Vienna, Austria next, uh, next month. So uh, that is um, very, very impressive. Um, and so congratulations to Avi and Ian. I, I think that is an incredible accomplishment. And... Um, not only am I congratulating them, but I am inspired and in awe uh, of their achievements. So um, that is a, a, a wonderful accomplishment. So let's go to the next slide here and we'll talk about uh, contact tracing. So I think, you know, all of our work is informed by the CDC, the New York State uh, Department of Health, the Albany County Department of Health and the governor's orders. Um, so the New York State Department of Health has uh, issued a direct guidance to us. The Albany County Department of Health forms and explains that guidance. And really, they are really our direct supervisor and guider, if you will, um, when it comes to implementing this. Governor's orders, executive orders, such as the order requiring mask wearing, is also important here in guiding the work we do in school. So um, when we are notified of a positive case, we could be notified directly by public health uh, um, uh, Albany County, or we could be, uh, you know, parents could contact us directly. But in any case, when we find uh, the uh, a positive case, um, we immediately begin the process of identifying who were the direct contacts in school. Okay, so we are responsible for developing a list of direct contacts in school, and there are targeted algorithms that have been provided by Albany County. And actually, if you look at the BOCES, the Capital Region BOCES serves uh, Albany County, Schenectady County, Saratoga County, and Schoharie County. Uh, those counties um, have developed identical algorithms um, for the various environments, including classroom, including cafeteria, uh, bus, sports, to determine um, who would be recommended to the county for quarantine. And then uh, the next situation would be that uh, we as a district would inform parents that they can um, anticipate uh, that the county will be contacting them and issuing them quarantine orders. So we inform parents that their child is a direct contact. 
we have um, a good, a very strong relationship with Albany County. And so um, we uh, alert them to that. Um, we uh, ask them to keep their child home um, because they have been identified by as a direct contact and that they will be receiving uh, the orders from the county shortly. So I think that's an important factor. Another important factor, moving around a little bit in the order here, is the fact that there is a distinction this year between those who are vaccinated and those who are not when decisions are made about quarantine. So I think it's important here for us to note that in the decision-making process. So now what we will do here is we'll go next to the various uh, settings uh, for um, a possible uh, determination of quarantine. So let's go to the next slide, please. And before that, I think um, there's a couple of, of things that I, I think we we need to remember here before we, we, we go to specifics. So people who have tested positive must isolate and are in isolation. So isolation is a very specific uh, setting. Um, they must remain um, in a, an area, um, unfortunately not in contact with the rest of their families. Um, it's different from quarantine. Quarantine is recommended for individuals who are direct contacts, okay? And um, it, I would say, for lack of a better word, it is less severe than isolation. The individual may go out inside their house into their yard, okay? But they are not to go out in public. Um, and um, it is specifically directed for those who are in direct contact. So we are providing some links at the end here, and this link is also guidance here. You can use this link and we will have links at the end of this presentation that will be posted here that will allow you to click on and to get specific isolation and quarantine guidelines. Next slide, please. Again, before we go to the specifics here, um, we have been asked by physicians <clears throat> who work in emergency rooms, and we've been asked to spread this message to our colleague school districts throughout the region that please do not go to the ER to be tested. Um, Essentially, um, ERs are concerned with being overwhelmed with people coming in for uh, testing. So given uh, the nature of a room, emergency room care, we want to keep them free for true uh, emergencies. And again, um, Albany County maintains a list of updated testing locations and vaccination clinics. And um, we have this uh, embedded in the links to be shared at the end of the presentations. We know that a lot of major pharmacies like Walgreens and CVS will do uh, testing. Um, you know, you there, there are a variety of options for testing that are available. Uh, some of them uh, with, with very quick returns, some of them with the rapid test, but uh, many also with the uh, more accurate and in, in some cases required PCR. So again, let's go to the specifics here and the next slide. Uh, so we are going to talk about classroom, cafeteria, transportation in terms of quarantine guidelines as specified by the Albany County Health Department. Um, but I would remind you um, also the Saratoga County Health Department, the Schoharie County uh, Health Department and the Schenectady County Health Department. So the 24 schools, in this region, both regional BOCES follow the same guidance. So let's look at classroom contact tracing. So these are the criteria considered here when uh, contact tracing goes forward. So the first question is this, were the students masked and distanced three feet from classmates throughout the lesson? Question one, masked and three feet from classmates throughout the lesson. If everyone was wearing masks and maintaining three feet of distance, no members of the classroom 
have to be quarantined regardless of vaccination status. So um, I, I know that we have had cases, obviously, okay, and um, parents may rightly question, well, my child was in a classroom and was wearing a mask. Why was my child quarantined? And I think to be conservative and an abundance of caution, the child may have, um, there may have been an activity where the child may have leaned in. The cumulative 15 minutes of uh, uh, in duration of direct contact was uh, exceeded or it wasn't sure if it was succeeded. So therefore in an abundance of caution uh, that individual who sat next to the person in class might be quarantined. We are not um, looking to quarantine excessively in any means whatsoever. Um, we share uh, the belief that it is um, so important for students to be in school every day. We also know that quarantining puts burdens on families, especially the families of younger children. So we are working to be more precise in what we do, not so that we quarantine more, but so that we can be even more surgical in the quarantine. Now, the good news in all of this with a classroom is that we are far more targeted than we were last year, especially during the surge of a coronavirus that occurred in November, December, January, and into February. Um, if you remember, there were entire classes and teachers being quarantined at that time. <clears throat> so I think the precision has resulted in fewer quarantines. It's important to note that literally 99% of our students or almost 99% of our students are <clears throat> in person in school. That's nearly 6,000 students. And so bringing all these students together is really, you know, we're very, very proud um, to be able to do that. And so to keep the number of quarantines um, that we have right now, given the vast numbers of students we have, is, is really a good sign. <clears throat> so the second bullet there is, if we discover that students were closer than three feet with the positive case and the duration of the contact lasted at least 15 cumulative minutes. So literally 15 cumulatives means five minutes here, maybe five minutes there, and five minutes there over the course of a 24 hour period. So then those students are listed as contacts pending a check of the vaccination status of each student. So if a student is unvaccinated, they will be quarantined, testing will be recommended. If a student contact is vaccinated, they will not need to quarantine as long as they are not symptomatic. But the CDC recommends that they test three to five days after exposure. And so, um, Michelle, I see your question. Uh, wouldn't uh, lunch be over that 15 minutes? And the answer to that question is yes. Um, we will be focusing specifically on yes. In a classroom, Jennifer, what is the spacing between desk? Is that three feet? Yes, it is. It is. Okay, so let's go to the next one and um, I'll hold that thought, Michelle. I'll be back to the cafeteria in a minute. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> the answer to your question, Michelle, is exposure in the cafeteria will be over 15 minutes. So I was at a meeting with all the BOCES uh, superintendents, Capital Region BOCES superintendents, the 24 within the region. Um, um, hardly anybody is able to maintain the six feet in a cafeteria. And it's important to note that in the guidance received, okay, the inability to maintain six feet in a cafeteria should not be seen as a, a way of 
um, uh, not returning to in-person school. And in-person schooling was the primary focus of the year. So what have we done? We've tried to reduce density in the cafeteria. We've tried to reduce time. Um, we have purchased picnic tables at some of the schools um, to, uh, or uh, another option other than that principals have chosen is that um, mats, yoga mats are used for students to go outside. Um, so the issue is <clears throat> we're students within six feet of the positive case for 15 minutes or more. <clears throat> if the answer to that, that question is yes, then they're listed as contacts pending vaccination status. So student contacts who are unvaccinated will be quarantined, testing is re recommended. But again, the same rule applies here. Those student contacts who are vaccinated will be asked to monitor and as long as they're not symptomatic, they do not have to quarantine. CDC does recommend testing after three to five days exposure. So um, let's take a look here. Um, Jennifer, question. If an unvaccinated student takes a test and is negative, the, uh, um, and Ms. Skills, I thank you for answering. Unfortunately, no is the answer, even with a negative test, DOH says the full quarantine must be served as the quarantine period rec uh, represents the full incubation period. So these are the rules as currently stated by the Department of Health. So that's the cafeteria setting. So let's go to the next slide, please. Transportation. Okay, so transportation contact rates. So all riders must be properly masked during the duration of the trip. And so one of the first determinants that what we have here was the bus ride 15 minutes or more, and we include the loading and the drop off time. And if so, were the students within six feet of the positive case again for a cumulative 15 minutes or more? So they ride the, with the same people going to school and ride coming back. Um, and the ride in the morning is eight minutes and the ride in the evening is uh, nine minutes or 10 minutes. Okay, that uh, constitutes uh, an exposure of 15 minutes or more because it's questions. It's, I'm sorry, it's cumulative. Um, so <clears throat> in any case, the county has given us charts to determine um, who will be a positive contact but basically who will be, be quarantined. So this is potential direct contacts are students who are sitting in the same row of the uh, positive uh, uh, case, two rows in front, two rows in back of the case on the same side, as well as students who are sitting directly uh, across uh, from the positive case. So um, <clears throat> these students are determined direct contacts <clears throat> um, pending the vaccination status. And these student contacts who are unvaccinated will ultimately be quarantined. Again, same rules apply. Student contacts who are vaccinated monitor their health. And as long as they're not symptomatic, they don't have to quarantine. But the CDC does recommend that they test three to five days of exposure. So um, uh, just in case uh, for our audience on the live stream, there was a question from Jenna. I know uh, there are assigned seats at Shaker Middle School and the elementary schools. What about the high school? My daughter has eaten all over the school from the classroom courtyard and cafeteria. And Ms. Skills uh, is, has the response here. The school does not have assigned seats in the high school. They are not. Given uh, the age uh, of the students, it's considered here that the contact tracer simply will ask, who did you eat lunch with? Um, and Mr. Wager adds here that um, opening the courtyard and other spaces in the building has reduced cafeteria density. So um, <clears throat> in the courtyard, um, off in the back of the school, uh, we have picnic tables, 
Um, we have Adirondack chairs, and in the upper courtyard, we also have picnic tables and Adirondack chairs. And um, yeah, encourage students to uh, eat lunch, and uh, it's a great spot um, if the weather's nice. And um, Jennifer, our, Jennifer uh, wrote our high school and middle school elementary using the same seating charts on the bus. They're using seating charts. I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. I'm, I'm sorry. They, they, yes, the seating charts are a factor in determining six feet, yes. Okay, so let's go to the next slide, please. Um, in athletics, um, we begin by interviewing the coaching staff, look at games and practice, what was the structure, uh, who might be in close contact. Um, we differentiate depending on if games and practice were outside versus inside, and if the sport is uh, deemed high risk. Um, as in every situation, we determine it. Was everybody masked and appropriately distanced when they were not playing? And then we identify members of any team who may have come within close contact of a positive case. And close contact is defined as being within six feet for a cumulative 15 minutes. Um, students who are unvaccinated will be quarantined, testing recommended. Uh, student contacts who are vaccinated will be asked to monitor health as long as they remain symptomatic, do not have to quarantine, but CDC recommends, again, that they test three to five weeks. Um, so a question here from Troy. Why has the lower courtyard been closed this week? The upper courtyard has been overflowing this week and people are having to sit on the ground. Could we move from the seating to uh, the lower courtyard to help fix this? Mr. Wager, um, we do mention, yes, we do, um, very shortly, longer. Uh, these are six foot currently there. These are eight feet as well. We do have additional picnic tables coming in for the lower courtyard. Mr. Wager says, I can check on that for you. Okay, next slide, please. So I will now turn this over to my colleague, Deputy Superintendent, Ms. Kathleen Skeels who will talk about support for students in quarantine. Thank you, Mr. Court. So one of the concerns obviously last year was when students would have to uh, be quarantined and how they would get their instruction because we know the quarantine period is 10 days. It's not often that we catch a case so early that it's the full 10 days, but it can be six, seven, eight days and that's a lot of classroom time to lose. So when we find out that a student has a positive contact and Albany County agrees and gives out the quarantine order, we recognize that we have to support our students in terms of both their instruction and their social emotional um, support, support during the time that they're home. A phrase we hear a great deal is the idea of zooming in, right? That, that is a phrase that, you know, pre-March 2020, none of us heard of, and now it's something we all toss around. So the idea of Zooming in is just that. So we're on a Zoom call right now, somebody Zooms in and they can therefore witness what is going on. Um, last year, there was Zooming in happening, um, especially toward the end of the year at the high school as more and more students uh, ended up going remote. They would zoom into the class and quite often, more often than not, we would have more kids on Zoom than we would have in person. This year, as Mr. Kaur said, the entire goal has been to bring students back to in-person instruction. And so there's a couple of big differences we want to point out between this year and last year. Last year, classes were capped at 15 students. So in front of the teacher would be 15 maybe 16 students, and in a lot of cases, 13 students. So if you had students who were Zooming in, one or two students, you also had a smaller amount in front of the teacher. This year, class sizes are back to typical sizes within the guidelines. So I want you to think about a teacher who is teaching 28 children, let's say, in, a, in an 11th grade class. 
Um, those 28 students are there, they're ready for instruction. And we have one student who is quarantined at home. The problem with Zoom, as you may know, is that you have to be behind the computer. If I move away from this either way, suddenly it gets harder to hear me. We don't have 360 degree cameras and microphones and distance learning rooms. So in order for a student to be able to Zoom in, a teacher would have to get behind a computer to be able to teach so that one student could see and hear while there were 28 students out there, that teacher then couldn't move around, couldn't support the students in the room, couldn't monitor the room for classroom behaviors, get to the different corners of the room. We teachers move all the time. So it doesn't set up the best situation. So then another idea is, well, what if they just listen in? Well, they could, but many teachers obviously are visual. So they're putting things up, they're showing things, they're giving examples, other students are talking. So it becomes very complicated. The other big difference this year is these guidelines, as Mr. Kors just described for quarantining, are very targeted. So it's not the likelihood that in a class of 28, 25 of them are going to be quarantined. If that were the case, then we put everybody on Zoom, of course. It's more likely that two or three might get quarantined out of a class. And that's true for K, and that's true all the way up through 12th grade. And so in this case, they would be home trying to listen in while the majority of their classmates are having, um, are having time with the teacher, which is not really an optimal situation. So instead, we've built a different model. It's not zooming in, but we've built this model with intention because we think it will actually be a more robust instructional experience for your students, we, your children. We think it will increase student engagement and it will give students direct access to a certified teacher. And I think that's the important part instead of just trying to listen in on a phone. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. So what does that look like? So in elementary school, we are setting up a system where we will have quarantine classrooms. They're going to start on Monday, October 2nd. We have classrooms in place right now, but this model, should I say, will start on October 2nd. And we have students divided as kindergarten and first grade. And we have a teacher, Karen Quaglia, who, who uh, will be in charge of K-1. We have two, three grade level band and Margaret Barnes, Maggie Barnes will be in charge of that. And four or five, Kim Sprint will be in charge of that. The students will get a minimum of two hours with this teacher. So for example, let's take Karen. She might have the kindergarten kids, if, if there aren't any quarantined, from nine to 11 for example. She'll have the first grade kids for 12.30 to 2.30, for example. In the time that they're in the quarantine classrooms, students will be able to, um, first of all, get some attention, right? Especially for the little ones, they may be confused, like, why am I home and my friends are at school? Why, why can't I go to school? So we'll do some read alouds, we'll do some fun activities with the students so that we'll take care of them and make sure that they feel safe and supported and comfortable. Then we'll do skill practice with the students. So let's say we know in kindergarten this week, they're working on certain letters or they're working on numbers, or maybe they're working on some one digit addition. So Karen will be leading the students, practicing those skills with them and helping them. As they get into the upper grades, for example, in four and five, Ms. Scaringe may do that a little bit differently. So she may take her fourth graders and she may open up breakout rooms. So she may gather them all together and then put them in some breakout rooms. I'm going to work with this group in a breakout room on some math. I'm going to work in this group in a breakout room on some science so that they can get the support. And these classrooms will be open for the entire length of the quarantine. In addition to that, the three teachers will be consulting with the student's actual classroom teacher and we'll be ensuring that they are working together so that they are able to um, get the exact homework so they can check in with students too, like especially as they get up to fourth and fifth grade, Ms. Garange will know what the homework assignment is. So in addition to doing skill practice, she can help them with homework. Middle school, as you know, this year, we're happy to say, yay, is grades six through eight. 
So they will get 45 minutes per core course. And in sixth or fifth grade, Mr. Harder will be uh, taking science and social studies. And Ms. Rizzle will be taking ELA and math. So students will have a rotating schedule when they're home. They'll open up the Zoom classrooms. The two teachers work together to coordinate a schedule. So they'll get a 45-minute class of social studies, a 45-minute class of science, 45-minute class of ELA, 45-minute class of math. Mr. Harder and Ms. Rizzo will be um, a part of each of the teacher's Google Classrooms, so they'll know exactly what the teacher is working on. They'll know what the assignments are, what the specific work is, so they can provide both instruction based on skills, but also support on actual assigned work. They will also serve as liaisons between students and teachers of other subjects. So they'll check in every day with the students to say, okay, are there other subjects beside this where you feel like you need some extra help? You might need some additional work um, in terms of um, maybe your health class. You might need some additional support. So Mr. Harder or Ms. Rizzo will then reach out to the health teacher and put that teacher in connection with the student. So they will serve both as liaison to the other classes, but actual instructors for the four core subjects. Um, Ms. Dawson, I'm getting some messages in the chat that I think this the your your bar your, your of seeing the people who are participants is in the way of the slides. If you can maybe reduce your 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 pictures by using those little dots at top, so it only shows the person who's speaking, that might help. Um, <clears throat> and also, uh, Heidi said that they uh, offer this the suggestion that they may may need to. Um, ex yeah. they may do expand their viewing window. That may help. Um, and Jane, if you can go to the next slide while, while you're working on that. Um, Ms. skills to awesome had a oh. question here. How about students with COVID like symptoms who are staying at home until test results are back? Uh, uh, have had three kids and siblings sent home when one is out with a cough and cold. Will they be given the same level of support? So right now we are supporting just the students uh, with this model. We're As we start, we're supporting the students who are on quarantine first um, because obviously that's six, eight, 10 days versus um, 48 hours for a COVID test to come back. We will also, um, as we get to testing, we'll talk later, but we will also um, in the future be able to do diagnostic testing at school when a student gets sent home if a parent wants that, so we can get that in the queue right away. But right now we're just using our regular um, mechanisms as if you were absent for two days because uh, you had a stomach bug in years gone by. So for the high school, the high school is slightly different because obviously you have all the students in one school. You have over 2,000 students in grades 9 through 12 taking many, many subjects. So obviously the more subjects you have and times per grade levels, the more complicated things get. So we have Laura Haley who will be opening up every day that his child is in quarantine, the quarantine classroom for 60 minutes. Um, she'll have different grade level bands. So for example, grade nine might be from eight to nine in the morning, grade 10 might be from nine to 10, um, et cetera. She'll be checking in with the students. She'll be making sure that they know how to log on to their Google Classrooms, which they all do, they're very good at that, and that they know what their assignments are. She will also be added to all the Google Classrooms. So she'll know who's coming into her room and she'll have an understanding of what those assignments are and what that work is so that she can view it and go over it with the students. But in addition to the one hour that they'll have with Laura and she'll check in to see if they're falling behind, if they need anything, et cetera. What we really wanted to do was make sure our students had time to make up some of that instruction that could be very complicated. And we all know, um, you know, missing a few days of, of high level instruction could really um, put students behind. So what we have done is thanks to, I will say it, thanks to the federal stimulus money that has come through, is we have um, implemented a tutoring program and as of right now, it's actually over 100 teachers, it was 99 when I originally typed this, have submitted their names to um, be considered for secondary tutoring. In other words, they are open to being tutors should they need to be called upon. So what will happen is 
let's say Miss Haley has a ninth grade student, she will open up that student's schedule and she will see who that student has for each of the, uh, his or her classes. So let's say it's English nine. She'll look and she'll say, oh, okay, Mrs. Gibson is this child's English nine teacher. She'll now look at the list of English tutors. If Mrs. Gibson is one of the people who signed up to be a tutor, Mrs. Gibson will be the tutor. If for whatever reason she has not, then uh, Ms. Haley will select another certified English teacher from the high school who teaches ninth grade English. And that person will serve as the tutor. They'll know what the work is and they'll be able to meet with the child. Um, students are able, are eligible, excuse me, to receive one 40 minute tutoring session for every two days of quarantine for all subjects. So if you think about that, if a child is quarantined today, let's say they're, they're starting their tutoring tomorrow, they may have their English, their math, and maybe their social studies person all in the same day. In that one day, they are eligible for 120 minutes of tutoring right there. The next day, it might be their science teacher, their art teacher. So in this model, what the student gets is actually one-on-one -on -one tutoring with either their teacher or another North Colony teacher of that very same subject so that they can check in, go over the work, teach any of the new skills, and keep our students so that when they come back to school, not only do they just have their homework done, but they've actually gotten the instruction that they might have missed when they were away. This model actually goes back to something that we had called home instruction pre-COVID. So if your child, um, I don't know, fell and, and, and broke his ankle and had to be out for uh, 10 days before they could come back to school, the child would go on home instruction. We would find a tutor. The tutor, who may or may not be a North Colony teacher, would be able to tutor the child for one or if possible, two hours, and that would be it. So the idea, same idea, somebody's out, we're gonna find the tutor, except the difference is you're getting far more tutoring because you're getting 40 minutes per subject, not just 40 minutes a day, where when previously, pre-COVID, it was one to two hours for everything. And more often than not, they're probably getting their own teacher as the tutor, but if they're not, they're getting somebody else from that very same department to keep them up with the work. To us, this is far better because if you're just listening in from home while 28 other kids are working with the teacher, the likelihood that in the middle as you know, a ninth grader, you're going to feel like you can interrupt and say, wait, I need that. Can you go over that again? I have a question. Sometimes they're, they're too worried to do that even in the classroom, much less if they're just listening in. Here, they'll have their homework during the day. They can start on their homework. When their math teacher logs in at night to, to tutor them, they can say, hey, I was working on this and I don't understand problem number 12 at all. Can we go over that? And suddenly you've got a one-on-one -on -one tutoring session. So we feel like this is a much more robust model. We understand the idea of zooming in is out there, but we really feel like this will better better benefit our students. Like everything we do, we're going to evaluate this. This is brand new. We're just up and running. We just built it for this year as COVID continues to challenge us and ask us to flex our thinking and think more creatively. So we'll monitor this at all three levels. We'll see how it goes. And we may come back to you in a future pack and talk about how we've had to modify it or change it um, in order to meet the needs as we move forward. Okay, next slide. Well, thank you, Ms. Skills, and uh, greatly ap appreciate it. Um, thank you, Ian. I greatly appreciate that comment. This is a really strong quarantine instructional model. I appreciate uh, I appreciate it. And thank you, Karen, also. Uh, appreciate that, that comment as well. We do believe it, and um, as I'm speaking to you directly, uh, I think Ms. Skeels uh, spoke to this um, extremely well, that um, we have a model now where if we have 25 students, we may have one student on a Zoom. And so a teacher is teaching to the 24 in the classroom. Um, it's not uh, possible here to be 
um, in front of this screen and teach the 25 in-person school students well. Um, Jennifer, you had a question here. Jennifer, Karen, what if a student, if it is a student with an IEP, how will they be supported and how will IEP goals be met? So, okay, I see Ms. Skeels put this in the chat. Um, we uh, also have special education uh, tutors and um, they will be uh, notified to provide support as well. Thank you. Okay, so um, Ms. Bongermino, our Director of Human Resources, will also be here to uh, add to the comments that we have on weekly testing. So what is the testing landscape here? So the governor um, orders mandate uh, that we test weekly all employees who are not fully vaccinated. Okay, so the mandate is for employees who are not fully vaccinated. The mandate requires that we offer, emphasis noted, weekly tested, testing to all that unvaccinated students whose parents request such testing. Testing is not mandatory for students. So it's there um, if families request it. Um, and the Department of Health recommends that we test any staff regardless of their vaccination stat status, anyone who wants to be tested. Okay, so um, that's it. If you want a test, you can have a test um, and that applies to students and to uh, adult staff as well. Next slide, please. So um, this region um, with the local, most uh, practically every school is going with the uh, Albany County Department of Health um, and so we partner with the county who um, in turn helps us partner with Quadrant Biosciences in order to meet the mandate. And um, we have a video um, that will be at the end of this. We won't show that video tonight, but you can certainly access it as a resource. So the test is done with a Q-tip like swab inside the cheek. Okay, there's rotations on one cheek and on the other cheek. And if a child can use a toothbrush, they can complete this test. Um, so the swab then goes in a test tube and the test tube tubes are gathered in pools of 12. They are then packaged and sent to Syracuse for analysis. So the uh, uh, results will arrive in an app that individuals will sign up for and register for those results will come in the to the app in 24 to 48 hours. And so the premise of pool testing is if you look at the entire pool of 12, if the entire pool of 12 is negative, nothing else is done, okay? You won't hear a thing and so that's a good thing. If there is a positive uh, result in the pool, then they go back and they do a reflex test where, where the individual is, uh, where the, it's individually tested. Um, those results will probably be due um, in an additional 24 hours. Go to the next slide. So only the building principal will have test results for students in their buildings. Um, so parents will be alerted when the sample is collected. Parents will be alerted when test results are available. And parents will also be able to see those test results through the app. So um, again, this testing is strictly voluntary. Um, if people wish to sign up for it, they can. Um, they will sign up through the app. And when you sign up for the app, essentially you are consenting to testing. So. Key point to remember is the samples are analyzed in groups of 12. If there's no positives in the group of 12, there are no individual tests. So if you don't get an individual results, that means you are negative because your entire pool of 12 is negative. Mm -hmm. Next slide. So logistics. All students who want to be tested can get tested regardless of vaccination status. 
So if parents want to be tested, their, their children to be tested, they can be tested. Um, I will uh, provide a letter uh, shortly um, with details about how the optional testing program works and how uh, about how families can go to sign their children up for testing. And so parents, if they make the decision to, yes, we would like to test, they will register, they'll get access to the app, which will provide them with the updated information from the time the sample is taken to the time the results are available. And the first tentative date is Saturday, October 9. Ms. Bongiorino, do you have anything you want to add here? Uh, no, Mr. Corey, you've handled okay. it very well. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we will have more information coming out um, in the letter specifically to, you know, how you register and how you register um, through the app. Um, but um, let me look here at the slide, at the, the, the chat. I just want to make sure um, that we get all caught up here. It's up okay. to date, Mr. Core. Okay, all right, so we've answered all the questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So again, if you have any questions, please submit them to communications at ncolony.org. We will forward those questions to um, anyone who, uh, who, to any individual who uh, is best um, able to answer them. So if it's about athletics, for example, would we'll go to Mr. Stein. Um, I think there are some questions out there. So Lisa had a question about elementary lunch. So let me go back to this, Lisa. I mean, I can, I can just tell you, I mean, I was just wondering at our school, um, we are not doing any outside lunches, no tables, no yoga mats. And I was just wondering if there is, you know, any thought to, because the kids are three foot, if there is any opportunity, and maybe it's a staffing thing where, you know, half of the kids have lunch and half the kids are in recess and then you kind of swap them back. So that way there could be more distancing because we are doing um, just lunches in the classroom at this point. Yeah, that is a good thought. Um, I think, you know, the, the concern is always about um, instructional time during the course of the day. Um, excellent suggestion. And certainly we can look at all um, suggestions and options so that um, we can reduce the vulnerability, if you will, at the lunchtime. Um, so um, it is difficult, okay, to cover all the lunches with lunchroom aids and the like. Um, that is uh, a, a problem and it's um, a difficult uh, task for any school district right now to get the staffing to do all these jobs, but absolutely a good suggestion. Ian, you had a question as well. Yeah, I just was wondering if there's any thought put into uh, arranging any surplus desks in the cafeteria or gym to safely space six feet for students to eat. So not necessarily. Yes, they have done that at the middle school. Um, I know we're doing that at our school. We have 60 desks in our gym and cafeteria. We're able to safely space six feet for all of our students. I know we have a lower amount of students than most schools in North Colony, but we'd be able to fit two or three sections at a time in the cafeteria and gym uh, at desks. Um, so I think, you know, that is a question um, that uh, there is a trade-off there. Um, so we consider physical education to be an important component of a child's comprehensive education and also an important facet to meet social emotional needs. Um, so, you know, again, uh, we will be looking at that particular aspect there, but um, there is a trade-off perhaps in the nature of physical education classes, as well as, um, you know, the uh, obligation to meet the state mandates in terms of time and frequency. Well, Jennifer, you had a question about um, 
Uh, so, I, so I know there was a bus driver shortage, but is the district okay with having 44 players on a bus along with coaches to get to games? This has happened. And I need to know if this will be the norm. I know parents can drive their kids to and from, but if parents weren't alerted to the packing of two teams on a bus, um, they might have made the decision to drive their kids. Okay, so I attended a meeting of 24 schools today. Um, not a one is facing acute bus driver shortages. And people are doing everything they can to accommodate this. So everybody has, um, every day they're down. Um, uh, I know we are down typically five, six, seven, eight uh, runs a day that have to be filled by someone. And those some ones can be substitute drivers. Um, they can be actually the mechanics. Um, they can actually be um, the supervisors in the office. Um, our circumstance is is better than actually a lot of people. So um, in that case here, uh, we do everything that we can. And Jen, you are correct. You know, one option is for families to uh, drive athletes to contests. Um, I understand and I appreciate the concern about if they knew in advance, but um, in any case, um, we may not always know that or may not be able to plan for that. So, okay. And the athletes aren't masking according to Twitter picks. Well, um, continue to work on that. Um, and Mr. Stein is continuing to um, emphasize that with, uh, with, the, with the athletes. Um, in moderate to low risk sports, they do not have to mask during contests. Other questions? Uh, Ms. Mr. Kaur, I know, I, get, I know with our specials, we want to obviously provide those to the students um, for their overall uh, well-being. I can also speak at our elementary school. We have um, at least one time in a six-day window when all three cohorts of fifth grade students are together in a music room and one cohort is next to another cohort is next to another cohort. And so I don't know, I've had a, a few parents reach out to me um, about that concern um, hey, that we've well, got, you know, we're, we're, we're mixing the cohorts regardless of, you know, and I think it's probably three feet, not six feet, but we had said that we weren't going to be mixing cohorts. So the parents were just concerned as to, you know, what we're, what we're doing versus not doing. Okay, um, that's a great question. So uh, any student who is masked, okay, can um, be in course. Course, there are not special quarantine rules for music classes. Okay, we do not have that um, a, a specific differentiated algorithm. They're treated as regular classrooms. Um, I will speak to Ms. Keo. Um, I know that our uh, principals and our supervisors of specials, music, art, physical education, um, have spent hours um, to try to develop schedules, but that is a good point that I will bring back, Lisa. I think, again, this is where um, we, uh, we are. Uh, again, quarantine rules impact students who are only near the positive case. I'm going to jump in here because Mr. Core has frozen. So I don't know if he's frozen for everybody, but I asked in the chat, a lot of people are saying yes. So Lisa, what I, what I was saying in the chat was, um, although I know we'll look into that just to see how many sections are together. Thank you for sharing that. 
But the one the one big thing is last year, as we mixed cohorts, don't forget that we didn't do that because that might mean one positive case in an elementary school sent the whole classroom home, right? So now, whether it's 20 kids or 40 kids, obviously, if, if they're distance and they're three feet and they have their masks on, it's still the group of kids who are right near the impacted child. So it's not the entire group. And I think, Mr. Corey, you're back. You froze for a while, so I, I just jumped in for you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Skills. Thank you for covering for me. Uh, Modern great, technology. I greatly appreciate that. Um, I'm back. I'm not frozen anymore. Um, are you, Lisa, are you talking when, when you say, can we get tables for all the elementary schools? Are you, are you indicating picnic tables? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think principals uh, had the choice between picnic tables or yoga mats. Um, some uh, chose the yoga mats. I'll put it out there for picnic tables again, though. Okay. Uh, at least as you can imagine, um, picnic tables are one of the scarcer items in the United States of America right now. Um, we were very fortunate to get what we have. Will parents be receiving a letter like the indicating there's a positive case in their classroom? Uh, no. That you will be notified if your child is a direct contact, but there, there won't be a letter um, indicating that there was a positive case in the classroom. And, you know, it is, um, you know, a balance between um, maintaining the privacy of individuals and um, safety. But um, given the fact that it, it's good news, if you don't get notified by us that your child was a direct contact, that means that you're in a good place. For kids who are vaccinated, would you prefer they get tested before returning? Um, yeah, I think it's a great idea. It's a recommendation from the health department. So um, yes, it's a great idea. Not a requirement, but a recommendation. If a parent chooses to get their, Jennifer, great question. If a parent chooses to get their child vaccinated, do they need to send a copy of the card to the health office? You're not required to do that. Um, and the uh, vaccinations are entered into the state system. Um, and so we have access to that, but this is also, um, once you get that card, it is a quicker way of notifying the school, so. Not, no objections to that at all. But but it's not a requirement. That's that's the good thing. Other questions. Okay. Well, it's hard to believe we're almost a month in, um, and. Um, it's uh, great to be here with you, um, unfrozen. Uh, and um, any additional questions here before we go or any, any comments, questions, or concerns? You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you all for being partners here with us. Um, is dismissal getting faster, more efficient? Um, yes, and it needs to get better. That's the short answer. It needs to get better. Thank you, Tabasum. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Well, again, it's always a, a you know a privilege and an honor to be here with all of you and. Um, you know, I know uh, we have four regularly scheduled PAC meetings for the year, and the next one is somewhere in mid-October. So that's probably when we come back on at that time. Um, but um, again, um, thank you to all of you and um, all your support and all your positive comments um, are so greatly appreciated um, and valued. And they mean the world, no doubt. 
Um, have a great evening, everyone, and take care. Thank you.